Hey friends, we are hopefully live this time. We see the on air again, but we had some trouble going live with Riverside today. And it seems like I, I can't see a live notification popping up again. So Riverside really doesn't seem to like us. But I am on, on the LinkedIn event and it says cancel now, which we didn't do. And it's not letting us stream. It's not letting us stream. Mm. Mm. Okay. Oh, that's a bummer. Do you, are, are you on LinkedIn now? Do you see any notifications of live streams popping up where you are? No, no, it says just, it's just like before. It says pre-live, the event will yeah. start soon, wait for the host to start. Nothing about it being cancelled either. Yeah, I don't, I don't, usually you see these notifications as well where you go in live, but that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen on Zoom, uh, on, on LinkedIn, and it doesn't happen on YouTube either. So there must be something wrong with the infrastructure. I open a support ticket, but maybe you can put a note in there that I was too stupid to set up Riverside and that we therefore won't have the live stream today. Fuck. Oh, I don't want to write that you're too stupid then. It's, it's better that you write just... Ah, I see a live stream now. Go live. Let's see. Now something happened. Yay! We are live. Finally. Finally we are live. Friends... <laughs> This was quite a ride on the background, so I'm sorry for being 12 minutes late, but the challenge was that we saw this on-air signal on Riverside, and for some reason we couldn't go live. We just it wasn't showing up anywhere, but here we are. Thanks for being with us. If you, are, if you still are, that is. Christopher, um, I'm very, very excited to have you here because we are going to talk about a topic I didn't know about before I met you, and that is business philosophy. Tell us a little bit, maybe the, the short form intro of the long, amazing one you did earlier. Brian is there with us. Brian, perfect. Thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, Christopher, take it away. What is business philosophy and what was your journey into it? So uh, after I finished uh, school, um, I went on a, on a journey uh, around the world for 80 weeks. And then when I came back and I looked through the catalog for the university in Stockholm where I live, I found that philosophy is probably the only topic that I can relate, relate to. So that's where my journey started. Um, and then I went deeper into different subjects and I studied for many, many years. I studied law, I have a degree in law, I have a degree in engineering, I uh, studied at the Royal College of Music, and then I have a degree in philosophy. And so all these different things that I've done, both in education and in experience working in different fields, have, have brought me to a place where I feel that um, I can relate to, to very many different topics. And, and philosophy is sort of a tool, amongst other things, to put things in perspective and to change perspective and to see connections. It's like a... It's a, a way to approach uh, almost anything, really, including business. I, th I would even say especially in business, because if there's one thing I learned the hard way over the last decade is that you have to be able to put things into perspective. Because if you let just minor things derail yourself and if you feel stressed all the time, it limits the ability to make good decisions and to actually grow the business. And eventually you're just sucking your life out of you if you don't practice this philosophical, uh, philosophical thinking. So you have a really well thought out model for this, how we can frame this abstract concept of business philosophy and implement it into day to day. Do you want to walk us through that or is there something we need to discuss before we can dive into that? Yeah, we can, we can look at it. I mean, in essence, it's, it's a holistic, I have a holistic approach, uh, which means uh, that it's not just for the mind, 
but it's also for, for the emotions and the body and our social aspects and the big picture that we're all part of. And, and based on my, my understanding and my experience in different fields, I've, I've made a model that I'm, I'm happy to share here. So um, let me put this on um, like this. Um, and so there are these different colors uh, and this division into four is probably familiar to a lot of people. And it's a way to categorize. Um, it's, it's, a very, it's a very old way to, to look at things in four. So different numbers have different qualities which help us to see structures. And, and four is a powerful way to, to look at these structures. So there is the body to the upper right, which is the red, which connects to movement, which we move our body, and, and also to leadership in a sense. And then the yellow field on the bottom right, it's, it's the emotional sphere, which connects to creativity as well as communication. So for, from my personal perspective, I've, I've worked a lot in creativity. I'm a musician, I'm a dancer, I worked in theater. And, and the creativity or the creative process itself, it's, it's a matter of, of trust to a large degree, much as with emotions. If we resist our emotions, they stay, but if we allow them and accept them, then we experience them and then they change. And there is a lot of wisdom in that. And then on, on the bottom left, there's a green field, uh, which is uh, connected to community, co-creation relations. So it's a social sphere, the social aspect of being human. Very, very uh, important to, to us humans to have connections with others from a, from a physical or a scientific point of view, we have the limbic brain, which is one, one of our three parts of the brain, which is all about connection, all about you know, being part of a community. And then there is the blue, the top left, which is uh, the mental aspect. You know, it's a more the neocortex, if we will talk about the brain again. Thoughts, philosophy, structures, to see how different things fit together. And for one thing, this model in itself is, is a blue map of the human, if you will. And then there is the middle, which is symbolizing the, the big picture, which is sort of an assembling of all of these put together. And that's when we, when we can see the whole and see how the different parts of the whole fit in, that's when things start to really take off. That sounds like uh, almost overwhelming to me, if I'm honest, but I, I see your point there. And for, for example, one thing out of, out of personal experiences, I usually get my emotions right. I've practiced stoicism quite a bit, and, and not from the perspective of philosophy, but just the, the way they deal with challenges really resonates with me. So I know that when I get aroused, I have a saying, and then I can come back into a state of mind where I make conscious decisions again very fast. But I, I can also keep emotions and community together but usually at that point the body gives because I don't set aside the time to exercise three days a week or to go out on a run three days a week or something like that and then I, I find that constantly I get two or three of those pillars right but the fourth one whatever it is in the current situation drops off is that is that something you deal with often when you when you work with clients on this I mean, one question you can ask yourself is, do you dance often enough? <laughs> I don't dance at all, no. <laughs> Maybe a bit with my daughter when she puts out funny music, but nobody's allowed to see that. Oh, well, that's, that's <laughs> hard. It's lovely. I mean, I, I, I think dancing is a very, very, very important thing to do as often as possible uh, in, in many ways. Because we all walk around in bodies. All the time we live in bodies. And uh, still, we kind of treat it like more like a slave uh, than uh, than a temple. And if we really take care and nourish all the different parts of ourselves, including the body, the body has its own wisdom. Yeah. If you if you spend too much time thinking, I think a lot of people, is, you know, who work in offices, for example, spend a lot of time thinking, sitting in front of a computer. And then, you know, we know we should exercise, you know, it's good for us, but, but it goes way beyond that. It's not about what we should do. It's like we won't be as efficient at all if we don't take care of all these aspects of ourselves. It's, yeah. it's actually a very uneconomic way to, to be human, if you will. 
You, you fit a nail on the head with the dancing, by the way. Florian just said, love that. Do you dance often enough? And then the smiley emoji right next to that. Maybe, maybe something I should incorporate. But I think there's also a lesson in there why I don't dance is because I don't give myself the freedom to. And I'd rather stay focused and stay on task and think about what can I learn or how do I maximize these 10 minutes that I have before my daughter comes home from pre-kindergarten or how do I maximize it. Even the walks with the dog, I learn. I use, I, I, I use Audible to, or podcasts or, for that matter, YouTube videos to digest and ingest information rather than taking time for myself. Mm -hmm. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is that a good practice to do, to be constantly trying to evolve? And I, I try to soak up everything like a sponge. Maybe 15% of what I, what I consume sticks with me. But over time, that compounds. Is that something that... What, yeah, what's your perspective on that? It's a good question. And I can understand the inclination to, to really make use of the time we have here. It's limited. We all know that. Uh, but to be honest, I find that allowing the mind to wander is a very valuable thing to do. And some of the best ideas come when we're not thinking about them, you know, in the shower or, or yeah. you know, after we turn off the computer for the evening or, or just you know, being out for a walk or uh, being on holidays, etc. That's like, boom, it comes, or in dreams. So, so then we're actually, by trying so hard to get to what we want, we actually miss these, the low-hanging fruits, if you will. It's just there for our taking. And, and I'd like to use an, as an analogy, when I play music or when I write music, um, I've written a lot of music, but to be honest, it's not so much I have, have written the music, it's more that I've been a challenge, channel for the music. It's the same when I play, you know, I, I can have difficulties playing, but if I allow my hands to play, then music will come through me and then I can just enjoy the ride. And same with dance. It's, it's not a performance. I think with dance especially, so many have so much, so many hang-ups around that. I had it as well, you know, from, from school. Dance was something we had to do and it was very forced and uh, difficult. And then... I was in India and, and went to, to Goa and all of a sudden you know, it opened. <laughs> and so transferring that to business, I think, I mean, a lot of businesses want to be innovative. Maybe not all, but most businesses see in a, being innovative as something really valuable. New ideas, new ways of doing things, new perspectives, new business models or whatever it is. And in order to be innovative, it really helps to be in an innovative frame of mind. And the innovative frame of mind has its own rules. It's not linear so much. It's not like if you push long enough, we will have the best ideas. I don't think so. I think it's more like if we let go, then we will you know, that's, happen. That's really interesting. How do we do that if we are under pressure? Let's say we just won an amazing business deal. We've got a really, really big and amazing client that we are looking forward to working with. But now the pressure sets in that we realize, damn it, we actually have to deliver on the bold promise that we made. How, how do you navigate stressful situations like that? And how do you give yourself the freedom to dance in those situations? Yeah, that's exactly it. You have to keep taking care of yourself to keep the practice of dancing and doing whatever you need to do to feel good and be in harmony, especially when you're under pressure. It's like uh, Gandhi said, oh, today I had so many things to do that instead of meditating for one hour, I meditated for two hours. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, actually, I mean, there is this tendency that, oh, it's too much to do. I, I got to really, you know, like this. But it's, it's, uh, maybe it feels counterintuitive at first. Yeah. But it's, it's just the other way around. It's even more important to have your, you know, eat well, to take care of yourself, do your morning routine, take time off, 
that's when the magic will happen. And because that, it's about getting into flow. And how can you get into flow if you're stressing? It's, it's not really how flow happens. It's much more about being present, being attentive, and allowing things to happen. Do you have some techniques that you could share with us on, on alleviating that stress temporarily? Like, how, how do we avoid getting caught off caught up in, in thought spirals yeah sure I mean uh, for one thing uh, to do meetings as uh, walk and talk meetings is a very practical hands on thing or phone calls you know just take your phone you're going to have a call with someone and then you go outside and walk in nature it doesn't matter what weather it is you just put on the right clothes and then you can walk or, or if you, if you want to talk to someone in person also to do it while walking um, that's a very easy thing. Or, or like, the, there is a there is an emergency technique. It's presented in the book, the, the Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse. If you really are like, feel that you're losing harmony or losing balance, you can just breathe out and keep the breath out for as long as you can. And when you can't keep it out anymore, breathe in and you breathe out again. You just keep the breath out again for as long as you possibly can. And what, that's what, it. what does it do? It's kind of a reset. It's like, okay. uh, it's just, uh, when, when you get really, like, when you blow out all the air, after a while you get to a point where the only thing that really matters to you is to be able to take another breath. So it sort of really takes away everything else, as an emergency technique. And then another, another way, I, I like to teach uh, my clients to juggle. It's also a very, very efficient way to focus your mind because if you're, if you're distracted, then you drop the ball. So it's very clear. It's like, choo. very easy way to meditate. That is really nice. So meditation is not like I, I'm sitting, legs crossed on the, on the pillow and do nothing. Meditation can have various forms. Is that yeah, what absolutely. you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about presence. It's all about being here and now. And, and all, all, all these images of someone sitting in a certain way, that's, that's technique. That the meditation itself is not sitting in a certain way or saying a, a mantra or whatever. Meditation is what happens when you do whatever practice you do. But it can be present all the time. In fact, uh, most advanced, the most advanced people, they meditate constantly, no matter what they're doing. Uh, Whoa. This, is natural, this is the natural, when you're fully relaxed, fully present, aware and meditation is so that that's essentially just realizing your thoughts realizing your actions and then constantly adjusting in the moment as to if you're doing the right thing yes and 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 maybe also not judging so much i mean um it's i think for, for me the way i see it it's it's a lot about acceptance i call it radical acceptance whether it's thoughts or emotions. Uh, but as you say, to adjust, like if you're driving a car, you all the time make these small adjustments. Yeah. But you've done it so many times that you don't think about it. It just come, it comes naturally. A little bit like this, a little bit like that, and then and you're, you're on the street. So it's, it's, it requires much less energy. In the beginning when you drive, you're like, really, oh, oh, wow. But then after a while, it's like, oh, you just relax and you can have conversations and you know, a lot of things can go on. So meditation is something to cultivate, like presence in a sense, presence. That makes me want to get back to meditating. I had, when, when I realized that I would be a father some three years ago, I hired a mentor who, uh, whose job was to, to help me prepare myself for being a dad while also running a business. I just wanted to make sure I can dedicate time to my family and not get caught up in the business side of things. And there was, coincidentally, shortly before the pandemic hit, so it wasn't, he didn't have an easy job with me, <laughs> to say it that way. And one thing he, he told me to do was to start journaling and to start meditating, to practice this mindfulness and this self-awareness. And I did that for... I want, say, want to say 13 or 14 months, I did that quite religiously, but then I fell off the bandwagon and I don't meditate anymore after that. I don't journal anymore after that. But what stuck with me 
I'd like to think at least, is the self-awareness that I can catch myself quite easily in decision-making processes and I can readjust um, identifying stress responses that are natural from, all right, I'm going off on a tangent and I don't need to be so hard on myself at this point. Mm. Very good. Very good. Is, is, is that something that you help your, your clients with as well, that, that they understand why they do what they do? And that's also that, that's where I would assume the business impact comes from because if you have the self-awareness and you're leading a difficult team meeting, for example, you behave way differently. Mm. Yeah, it, uh, absolutely. It, it, can, it can present itself in, in many different ways. I find that the way that I work is very bespoke, so it's, it's very individual. We each have our personal journeys, so, so for one person it presents itself in one way, maybe it's around relations or around leadership or around you know, managing stress, but at the end of the day, it's a lot about what you're talking about, about self-awareness. Um, and. Also, it's, I, th I think it's, uh, it's about understanding the purpose of things. It's like, why are we really doing this? When, you, when we get caught up in whatever it is, if it's a discussion around something, maybe there's some prestige around something, or you know, there's anger, or there's whatever it comes up, then clearly we're not really operating at our best capacity. And it's very human. I mean, it happens... But, uh, but it's, it's something to cultivate. Um, and I'm thinking, like, when, when we're very, very young, we learn to walk, and, and we, we spend enormous effort to learn to walk. And we fall and get up, and fall and get up, and fall and get up. And finally, we master it, and we're really happy, because you know, all of a sudden, we can walk. You have, you have children, I also have children. It's like something we have, you know, experienced. Uh, but then after that, you know, we, we don't think so much about it. We just take it for granted. And this is another skill like this. You know, if we, if we apply a constant attention, we learn it, we learn it. And then after a while, it becomes more natural, much, much more easy. But for some reason or other, it's, it's like uh, it's a more of a nice to have than a need to have. And, and I think that our world now is, is in a, is, has entered a new phase, a new time where it's, not, it's no longer a nice to have, to, to think in terms of, of business philosophy, it's a need to have, if you want to be successful in the future. So, I mean, the, in the past, businesses typically had, there is the operative level, you know, what are we going to do, there is the strategic level, so how are we going to do it? But then there is also the philosophical level, which I think is about why are we going to do it? the purpose, our values, mission, vision, all these kind of things. Most companies have that on the website somewhere you can read about it. But not all companies actually live it daily as much as the operative and the strategic level. And I think yeah. those three are like three sides of a triangle. Now here's the number three. So all three have to be alive and present in the way that we conduct business if we are really going to thrive and be uh, winners of tomorrow and for one thing to to make our company attractive to people to work at to attract the best employees to retain employees most most young people today want to feel that oh yeah this this means something i'm not just here to get the paycheck but i'm you know i have a higher purpose you know i'm part of this company because we're saving the world in one way or the other however you want to frame that whether it's to feed the hungry or it's to you know build railways but still it's like it's more than just a job this yeah. is something which is uh, more and more important to more people and then the, the philosophy aspect it's just it's just necessary to bring it i i love that you've bridged the gap to the to the uh, employment situation right now because i have a client they do uh, online recruiting funnels for exactly that that reason it's really hard for companies to find the right talent. And what you're saying, if I understood correctly, is, is when the business philosophy matches the, the values of the talent of the potential employees, 
that is where where you have this deep connection. That is where you actually click with the employees. You find them and and you you retain them. Is that driven by by a mission statement? Is that driven by some piece of text on the website? Is that driven by financial goal? Maybe I have a friend who pays uh, the, his salespeople extraordinary bonuses and motivates them that way, and it's their philosophy to let's say, hit 100 cold calls every single day, that's what they do. What does it look like in real life? And I know that's a very broad question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose it, it can look in many very, very different ways, but but at the end of the day, I think the, the, important, the important question is to ask yourself, um, is this a place where I, as an employee, is this a place where I really want to be? And sometimes I, I do a, like a, a lacmus check, you know, when you check something. Um, if money weren't an issue, what would I be doing? And if, if the answer to that question is, oh, I probably would be doing what I'm doing now, then I think you're onto something good. Because if money is the only motivator, that's a very shallow It's yeah. not bad with money, of course not. I mean, businesses make money, and money is, you could say, the lifeblood, or, or um, as my my business philosophy friend Garrett says, but there's something else. But, but if it's only that, if it's like, okay, we, we're going to make as much money as possible. Like I had I had a manager once who tried to motivate me by saying, our only reason for existing is that we make money for for the for the owners. And I, I didn't even know the owners. You know, there was someone else. That did not motivate me. Uh, motivation <laughs> is, in a, is on a different level. Yeah. So if, if it's only money, then it's, it's very shallow. It's very shallow. And, and shallow, if, if the roots don't go deep, then there is a storm and then the tree will fall. But if yeah. you have these deep roots which go into the purpose, it's like, well, this really means something. Then there is the potential for, for the big growth. Like, for example, Apple is a, is a company. Uh, which has had tremendous success. And I think a large part of that is because it was really, really, it was, it was led by a visionary. Not anymore, maybe, but, but still, it was founded by a visionary. The same with, with uh, Elon Musk and other visionaries. Like, okay, you know, one thing is what you do, but, but when, it's, when, when the, it comes from this place of like, you know, we're doing something important and big, that's when it becomes interesting i love it and we are hitting a chord with florian about the dancing again i, I challenged him and asked him if he does dance enough himself <laughs> and he also has room to improve so all right that is uh, wh what's your favorite routine you you've mentioned morning routine early on in this conversation is dancing a part of that is dancing a part of the evening routine or do you just do it every time you feel like it Uh, well, dancing is, the, it's a great question, and thank you for asking it. Dancing is one of the things, it's, it's always really good to dance, whether it's morning or evening or the middle of the day or maybe in the, even in the night. But, um, so dancing is great. Um, I like to start the day with yoga and qigong, meditation. That's like kind of this waking up the body. But sometimes when I, when I go to dance workshops, you know, dancing five, six day, hours a day, I find that uh, it's, it's just uh, wonderful. I don't, I don't feel the need to be anywhere else. I just feel like this really, this really makes sense. Mm. And, and also, like, again, translating it to a business situation, I was, I was arranging a uh, lunch dance for innovation here in, in Lund in South Sweden as a way to you know, take, take an hour off during lunch break, when you have, have your break anyway, just dance a little bit. Remove yourself from whatever you were doing and then go into a completely different activity, a completely different frame of mind. It's like flushing your, your brain with, with, the, with new pot, pot, potential. And then you can come back and look at things from a different, different direction. And coming back to your question in the beginning about these different pillars and, you know, how, how are you... You know, are all of them present? The, the, one of the cool things that I, is that if you do 
get into all these uh, activities which for example dancing is not just for the body but because then then emotions come as well and you do it with other yeah. people so the relations are there and thoughts come as well so so there is something about this when you do holistic things then you are quite naturally embracing all these different parts for yourself yeah. uh, but i think that the trick is to to have a little bit of all and that's how i that's how i work with my clients to include a little bit of this a little bit of that and to then build it for this whole so what what does that work look like if somebody wants to start improving or adding business philosophy to to their play to their day to day what what process do you walk them through well i listen a lot that's why i call myself the listening philosopher um, so it's it's really about uh, being present for for the other person and also being present for myself um, and again it's it's about this trusting the process trusting um, the natural creative process which is always there it's it's like in nature if you look at things the trees they grow by themselves and and we also have this natural creativity so i listen a lot in order to understand but also in order to to arrive at that which is really important so it usually starts like this and then based on what comes out of the listening we take it from there i work very intuitively and sometimes it's a good to start with individual sessions to talk usually quite long conversations three hours at least um, if it's possible two three hours but three hours is a good time to really have the chance to, to slow down the first hour is is sort of like the warm-up and then we get into the deeper questions um, and that's where a lot of transformation happens and a lot can happen in three hours yeah um, so it's it sounds like a long time all oh, three hours but but it's an investment which can really make a big difference um, yeah. and then also it can be in group sessions I like to start working with with the leader of a group if, if it's in a business for example you know, the, 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 the top leader or or whoever you know, have this this uh, capacity courage the, the interest the inspiration to start working this way and then to involve the, the team whether it's the team of leaders or how the organization looks um, and then depending on what comes up we will approach it from different directions but it's 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 leading to sort of it's going very deep in the personal but going very deep in the personal we arrive at that which is uh, which is universal so there is a deep sense of recognition in that and how do you set priorities um when i look at these four pillars body thoughts emotions community i could feel like I have my emotions in check pretty much. Just talking from my perspective, I'm, I feel like my emotions are in check. I feel like I could use more community. I feel like I could use more time to think. And I'm certainly not exercising and not taking care of my body as I wanted to. How do I know what to focus on in this process? So what I'm hearing you saying here, Jan, is that your emotions are in check. I'm curious, what does that mean? Um, for me, it means that I'm happy most of the day, that I can tolerate stress pretty good, and that I can, I can serve my family as being the, the, the rock, the waves are crashing over, as the, the usual picture I would paint, is that when my wife gets upset, I can calm her down. When my daughter gets upset, I can calm her down. And I just listen, essentially taking your role to a degree, try to understand what is going on there, and then moderating the situation. And I have right now the ability to set my own emotions back in those times of situations and process them later on for myself so that, that I'm not just piling up garbage. But on another, on another, the other side of the coin is, 
I do not take the time to exercise and to take care of my body. And then when I look at pictures from five years ago where I was in peak shape, and I feel like I am this dumb F that uh, that doesn't care about his body anymore. And I, I find little tweaks like intermittent fasting and stuff to feel a little bit better about caring for my body and mind. But I'm not not consciously setting aside or prioritizing my body and I'm not prioritizing time to deep for deep thinking. Mm -hmm. Is is there such a thing as a priority or is it just a balance that comes and goes based on phases of business and phases of life? Um I I don't I don't uh, want to generalize here. Um I I think it's these kind of, of, it's about a dynamic balance rather than a, yeah. a static thing. So, so in in one situation, one situation will call for one and another for another. Um, so, a, a good starting point is is awareness of these different fields of the human experience. So, like, okay, you're aware that. That you could you could spend more time exercising, um, and I'm not talking about feeling guilt because oh I should do more of this I should do that because that doesn't really help, but more of an awareness to say okay at this stage in my life, for various reasons there are circumstances, which means that I can only exercise once a week. Okay, so then then accept that and be happy with that. Um, and then maybe in, a, in another phase, uh, things change. This is this is life for most people who live live a regular life, whether you have a family or not, or you, know, you have work that has demands on you. So, so there, are, there are things that you have to consider. Uh, but awareness of these different aspects of human experience. Is, is important. And also, if you notice, for example, now we've talked, you notice that, oh, you don't meditate as often as you used to do, and, and maybe you would like to do that. All right, so then do that. You know, then that can be a good wake-up call to say, okay, from now on, I'm going to do that. And to start small, that's really helpful. Uh, to start small. Like, if you want to start to meditate, it's very, very difficult to start a new habit and say, oh, I'm going to meditate two hours every day. <laughs> yeah, great, but you're probably going to fail after one and a half days. So why don't you just start with, you know, two minutes a day or, or half a minute a day and just get that habit going, 10 seconds a day even. Just like, okay, I'm going to sit down and breathe twice because you cannot tell me that you don't have time to breathe twice consciously every single day unless you're in a war. And that, even then, then you probably do have time to like, okay, I'm just going to sit down and breathe. Two yeah. breaths. I love it. So it's essentially what you're saying, if I understand you correctly. It's a game that we are playing that comes and goes. And we have to be aware enough that we can set priorities. And that's exactly where you come in. And that is why... Uh, I fired my mentor before I knew that before we were in touch, before we connected in BIP, because I realized that I need this outside perspective because mm. it's really, really easy to get so eaten up in your own world. And at some point, I think we have to be as business owners. If we don't toot our own horn, who will? So we have to pump ourselves up and we have to, to find energy in what we do, but on the other hand, that takes away the ability, for me at least, to look at what I'm doing from a distance level. So if I don't set aside time in my calendar once a quarter to do that review for a full day, I wouldn't do it and I wouldn't be able to stay on track. And that's why that's where your help comes in on a regular basis. Mm, yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I think it, it can help in this way. Um, but at the end of the day, the way I approach it is that everyone really knows what they need when it comes to the to the who we are. And I think it's it's applicable for for many things. So we really do have the answers. I mean, 
for example, you say, oh, I know I should exercise more. Oh, that's, you know, you should exercise more. So you already know that. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. But, but it's more about supporting you. It's more about supporting people to, to like, okay, so how can this actually turn into action? So even if this, you know, business philosophy, it might sound very lofty and very like, oh, you know, out there exploring, I like to be very pragmatic. What can I do here and now? You know, small steps, implementing habits. So it's not just something that we talk about, but it's something that we implement and live day to day. And, and for me, it's very important to, to live by example. So, so I practice this myself. It's not something I tell others to do. It's something I practice myself. And this is what I think is, is also leadership is about. If you want to be a powerful leader, then you lead by example. And then people will see that and say, like, oh, they, that's inspiring. And then, you know, they, can, they might follow. And they might not, but at least you're taking care of yourself. And by taking care of yourself, you already feel good. And that is a reward in itself. Yeah. And then it will spread. I love this. Christopher, how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about your model? Thank you very much. So um, my website is seriousounds.com. S I R I U S S O U M B S dot com. This is a good way to find me. I'm also on LinkedIn with my name, Christopher Sigmund, and and um, I'm I'm very happy to to have uh, conversations, exploration calls uh, initially to see if there is a rapport. You know, if, if this is something that strikes a chord, then let's have a talk and see. How we, how if there is a personal chemistry? Because the way I work, work, it's it's important that we both feel like okay, yeah, this this is interesting. Let's talk more. So, my website seriousounds.com. It's uh, in the comments as well. Yeah, it's in the comments. That's brilliant. Thank you. And then on LinkedIn as well. I'm happy to engage. Perfect. Friends, thank you so much for spending time with us, for bearing with me. The, the delay is completely on me, so don't blame Christopher for that. And uh, I appreciate Jim sharing the podcast episodes that you did. I'm just looking at my other screen to check the comments here. Jim James, the Unnoticed Entrepreneur podcast, the partner of Scalefest, by the way. Very, very happy to have you, Jim. And he had two blog posts shared on this topic as well, which is interesting for me at least, to uh, learn how to fix live streaming. <laughs> you, should have, you should have assumed I've done this before. But anyways, Christopher, this was a very, very enlightening session, and I hope you get lots of conversations from this because what you do is needed in today's world, and we need more self-aware business owners who don't just follow the masses but make educated decisions based on what's right. Thank you so much, Jan. It was a real pleasure to, to talk to you. Thank you so much.